Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar today where I will be discussing toileting and the skills required for your child to be toilet trained. And um, this will be a pre-recorded webinar, so I'm going to go through the presentation, but at the end I'll be live to answer any questions you have, and um, where you can ask me on the chat box, or you can I'll be live to answer face to face as well. And um, or if you have any feedback or anything on this presentation, that would be great. So I'm just going to go through the presentation here. So welcome everyone to this toileting webinar. Um, my name is Uno O'Connor. I'm a paediatric occupational therapist here in North Cork Primary Care. So some background to toilet training and the skills that are needed before a child can be toilet trained. Um, a child's bladder and bowel function is not fully developed until they're walking, typically by 18 months. The bladder and bowel muscles are some of the last muscle groups to come under voluntary control. Toileting is a developmental skill that requires progression of the nervous system and the mastery of a complex range of motor, language, cognitive and social skills. So there's a number of things we need to consider as to why a child may be struggling with toilet training or any challenges they might face. So some of these characteristics or skills that we need to consider are, first of all, the motor skills. Is the child able to move to the bathroom and to the toilet independently? Are they able to wipe their bottom effectively? Are they able to get on and off the toilet or do they need assistance or a step? Are they able to adjust the clothing before and after toileting? Um, this might be particularly tight fitting clothing. Are they able to start with shorts or loose clothing? Are they able to flush the toilet, wash and dry their hands when finished or do they need prompting? The attention skills then, are they able to remain seated on the toilet for the, the duration needed? Are they able to follow a sequence of actions to complete the toileting task? Language skills, are they able to express the need to use the toilet? And this can be through pictures or through words. Are they able to understand the instructions given or do they need the steps to be broken down even further? Social skills then, are they able to recognise socially acceptable places and times to go to the toilet and emotional readiness to be able to say goodbye to the nappy and to move on to underwear and able to flush away the contents of the bowel movement. So when to start toilet training, this is dependent on the child and whether they're showing the signs that they are ready to be toilet trained. But typically around two years of age is when a child will start to and um, start to be learning how to toilet train. So some of these signs that they are ready are, does the child's nappy stay dry for two hours? Does the child wa not want to wear a nappy anymore? Is the child taking the nappy off after going to the toilet? Does the child tell you when they're doing a wee or poo? And does the child want to watch you in the toilet? It can be another sign. So a checklist for using the toilet. So it's important to take the steps your child can do, and this will help you to know what part of the toileting are they able to do independently, and then looking at the, the steps then or the components of toileting that they're not able to do that need to be worked on. So is the child able to pull their pants down? Are they able to sit on the toilet, wee and poo in the toilet, wipe their bottom after going to the toilet, pull their pants up independently, flush the toilet, wash their hands and know when they need to go. So typically this will be the last step is when they recognise that they need to go to the toilet. So I have a template here on this, all the skills that are needed, starting from the very bottom, working up, where you can put down the date and show what, what steps they're getting and gradually learning the steps that are needed. Um, and just to record if prompts were needed, do they need assistance or help with that? And to slowly take a step back and give them that independence and that particular skill. So starting off, can the child sit on the toilet for two minutes supervised? Can they then do it unsupervised? Are they able to get onto the toilet, pull down their pants? get to the toilet with or without any aid? Um, are they able to follow instructions to get to the toilet? Are they cooperating? Are they holding on to their wee for at least an hour and a half during the day? Are they able to tell or indicate to you when they need to wee or poo? Are they telling you or signing to you that they need to go to the toilet? And the final step then, are they able to go to the toilet without any prompting and have no accidents with the wee or poo? So that's your very last step. If this isn't working, you're really struggling with the toilet training. Another technique or alternative to toilet training um, is habit training. So this is an adult driven, highly routinized and scheduled program. So this is appropriate when the child has not been successful with other training techniques. They're lacking the awareness or aversion to being wet or soiled. 
They lack the awareness of the need to eliminate. The child is resistant to toilet training. The child is disinterested in toilet training or the toilet toileting patterns are difficult to determine. So this can be a useful method. So this is where we're going to set a toileting schedule based on the times of day your child is likely to eliminate. So we'll record all the times that the child eliminates. Um, so a useful way of doing this as well is if your child is if you give your child lots of fluids during meal times, so at breakfast, lunch and dinner, giving them the opportunity to have loads of fluids. And then, you know, about 10 to 15 minutes afterwards that we're bringing the child to the toilet and um, straight after and record um, that time because they more than likely need to um, go to the toilet after that. And um, complete a daily intake and elimination record. Collect at least a week's worth of data to get a good picture of your child's patterns and use pictures for each step of the toileting routine to make it easier to break down the task. So here I have an example of an elimination record. All these templates I'll have at the end of the presentation that I can hand out to you um, by email. Um, so here we can see the date, the time where you're recording. Is, is the child dry? Was their nappy wet or soiled? Did they urinate in the toilet or was there bowel movement in the toilet? So we're recording all of this. Um, and then the daily intake as well trying to take an intake of their food and particularly their drinks um, and just records that so that you know when when are they going to the toilet after the food intake. Visual schedules are a great way to both communicate for the child to communicate what step they need to do and um, but also to break down the, that task into the steps required and so that they're able to see those prompts. And um, so I will put these um, at the end of the presentation as well. I'll have these templates and what you can do is print them out and put them in the bathroom so the child is able to see all steps that are required. So whatever technique or way you're going to toilet train, it's important to consider the position of the child on the toileting because this will have another impact on your child's ability to wee or poo in the toilet. So it's important that your child's bottom should be touching the back part of the toilet seat. Their feet should be flat on the footstool and not hanging down in midair. And this might be because the child might not have the core strength to keep themselves up. They need their feet to be supported so it's not putting as much um, kind of pressure on our core strength that they're able to sit longer on the toilet. The step height will depend on your child and your, to and your toilet. Make sure your child's feet and legs are apart when they're sitting. Have your child lean forward with a straight back and this means they bend from the hips. And when your child is passing wee or poo, get them to push out their tummy above the belly button like a balloon. And this allows the bottom to open and the poo to come out. And if it doesn't work the first time, take a rest and try again. So sitting on the toilet, never force the child to sit on the toilet. Start with sitting with the lid down or close on. Aim to sit between two to five minutes maximum and then gradually increase the time as long as the child is successful. Start with the first nappy changing of the day and then increase to every nappy change or every meal of the day. Keep the toilet toy interesting. Rotate toys and activities. So using rewards. Rewards should be appropriate. Social rewards are better than material rewards. So, for example, after the toilet, we're going to go outside and play in the trampoline for five minutes with a sibling. Rewards should be offered immediately. Combine rewards with specific praise. Ensure consistency among caregivers. So if your child is being minded by a grandparent or babysitter to make sure that they know the strategies that you are using and what toys or rewards that you are using. So it's consistent and then fade out praise and rewards over time gradually. So using a toilet toy, the child should be motivated by the toy. Reserve the toy for toilet time only so they associate this as a positive experience. Store the toy beside the toilet. Take the toy away once off sitting is finished. An activity might be as motivating as a toy like singing a song um, and avoid using technology such as an iPad as this may be distracting for the child. So looking at the sensory side so of toileting, so a child may be able to functionally go to the toilet, but there may be a number of sensory different preferences or ways that the environment may be making it stressful for the child to be able to go to the toilet independently. Um, so we're just going to look at these parts here. So for children who are sensory seekers, OK, so there might be some parents who might identify with their child having these um, 
with characteristics. So the child may repetitively flush the toilet, they may smear poo, repetitively have accidents in pants, enjoy and enjoy the sensation, play in the water, play in the sink and ask to use the toilet in public constantly. So this is if this is impacting them being able to go to the toilet um, because they're constantly being distracted by the environment, there's a lot going on. And um, it's important that they get these sensory the sensory input throughout the day and um, in other ways or forms. So if they like playing in the water or the sink, are they getting this throughout the day? Do they like water play outside of the bathroom? Um, with repetitively flushing the toilet, can we put a prompt on top of the toilet seat to say flush once or uh, no across the signal no for the flushing so that we know that it's only one more time to prompt them to stop? Um, and then, yeah. Next one then is the sensory avoiders. So the child may avoid wearing big boy or big girl underwear and they might still prefer to wear the diaper. They will tell you when the diaper needs to be changed but doesn't want doesn't want a wet diaper because they don't want a wet diaper. They might have difficulty tolerating new bathrooms, public bathrooms, etc. They may cover their ears when flushing, air hand dryer goes on, etc. They may hold their no nose for bowel movement. They may avoid using certain toilets with hard seats and they may avoid going into the bathroom or sneak off to poo in diaper behind a couch, etc. So sensory defensiveness then. So this child may dislike the feeling of peeing or pooing and withhold. They may be fearful of falling into a regular sized toilet. They may dislike the feeling of wiping or being wiped. They may prefer the parent to wipe them. They don't like to wash their hands. They take off all their clothes to use the toilet and they avoid flushing the toilet. So this can might lead to a hyperactive response to the sensory input. The child may be fearful of the sensations involved. They may report that they, the acting of peeing or pooing hurts terribly. And they might end up crying. They might have extreme reactions to the sound of the flush or the hair dryer. And they might gag or choke with the smell of the poop. And they might be visually distracted by details in the bathroom, including lines in the tile, dust on the floor, etc. So it's important to look at the environment and how this is impacting the child. So I'm just going to go through some things here that might be useful. So looking at the vision, some things to consider is there are there shiny tiles, we might need a dimmer switch, familiar pictures and toys. They might dislike mirrors, maybe covering the mirrors. The room might be maybe too open. Can we put cubicles decorated by the child inside the bathroom? The room may be claustrophobic. They might like the door to be open. They may be scared of the toilet pan. Could we put a bowl in the loo or potty or commode? They may be scared on the high toilet, maybe putting something next to the toilet, a toilet frame or step. And they will not look at the poo, so make it into a bit of a project. Then looking at the touch or texture. So some things to consider might be, is the toilet seat too cold or hard? Maybe a gel seat or toweling cover. Fear a splash of poo in the water, so maybe putting a paper on the surface of the water so that it doesn't splash as much. Maybe they like to have their nappy on, so tight pants are getting used to other textures inside the nappy first. They may like to sit in the poo, so we might put some, a reward or something even nicer that might be more appropriate. Fear of touching poo or liking it, so maybe try sensory play brown play-doh, mud pies, more sensory play, avoid using gloves if possible. And then children with autism may like the sensation of controlling the pee or, poo, pee or, or poo, and this may result in UTIs or constipation. So it's important to note this. If you notice that a child is suffering from UTIs or constipation, definitely link in with your GP. Um, important thing here with the touch and texture, if you notice your child is quite tactile defensive in that they don't like the feeling or to touch or to when they're white, in the bottom, they, they have a fear of touching the poo. We want them to get used to messy play or other textures on their on their hands so that they're able to tolerate that first before then going on to the poo. So looking at Play-Doh, like the brown Play-Doh there, any kind of slime, messy play, shade and foam, things that they can mess with first, and then they might be able to tolerate that when wiping themselves. Um, okay. So then hearing, if you're noticing your child is covering their ears when in the in the bathroom, it might be too echoey. So putting towels on the rails, it might be too quiet. So maybe putting some music in the background, the hand dryers. So we could put maybe an out of order sign or ear defenders that might be useful in that situation if they're very distressed um, or recording the sound of playing at home. It might be a case of if they don't like the hand dryers, they might be in an uncontrolled environment where it's a new environment for them and they don't like it. it's a new environment, new 
in post communion with the hand dryer and um, so making sure that they're prepared for that situation and that they feel more in control so by recording the sound or playing it at home they're more prepared for that um, for that situation when it happens so then flushing get used to it when not training play recording of the noise the child chooses when flushed so they're in control of it and they may like feedback like musical posse and positive words is always good as well to make it a positive experience so looking at interoception then, so we have our five sensory systems and um, some of you might have gone to the sensory processing webinar where we would have discussed taste, touch, smell, sight, hearing and we also talked about the vestibular and proprioceptive sensory system. Our eighth sensory system then is our interoceptive sensory system. So the sense of signals that come from inside your body. So how this may be linked to toileting is if you notice your child is unaware that their bowel or bladder is full that they feel that they need to go need to go but not be able to discriminate whether they need to urinate or have a bowel movement they are unable to push in order to go they don't understand how to make these muscles work they cannot feel that they have had an accident or that their clothes are soiled and they're unable to bend and reach behind them to properly wipe and if you identify this to your child it's good to link in with your therapist about this so nighttime incontinence then so bed wetting occurs when a child is over five years old and is still wetting the bed. So 20% of five year olds and 10% of seven year olds would still wet the bed. They're more, it's more common in boys than girls. And some reasons for bed wetting. So if they are unable to wake up quickly enough when the child is asleep, the brain is unable to recognize the need to do a wee. Um, an overactive bladder may result in small frequent wheeze during the day and night. They may have reduced production of a hormone released from the brain that concentrates wee overnight, resulting in large amount of wee before produced overnight. Um, it may be important to link in with your public health nurse or a neurosis nurse um, to discuss any of these things. If you are concerned, if your child is over the age of five and this is becoming a persistent problem, um, it would be good to link in with them. I'll just quickly go through some strategies that may be useful or things that you might want to consider, but it is good to link in with the nurse here for some of these. Um, so first of all, teaching nighttime incontinence. So when to begin nighttime training. So when a child is independent, independently completes toileting routine during waking hours, but wets the bed at night, it's important that they are able, they are toilet trained during the day first. Um, that their bladder and bowel control for most of the day with occasional wetting or soiling accidents. So we're only having the occasional one. Um, and those who just need occasional reminders to flush, wash hands or turn the tap off. So avoid toilet training a child at night when frequent or regular wetting or soiling of clothes in the day of time. Avoid teaching daytime and nighttime bladder and bowel control all at, at once. Address daytime needs first. So tips for teaching nighttime continence. So limit fluid intake in the evenings and rely on daytime consumption to provide adequate fluids. So a good one here is during mealtime, make sure the child has lots of opportunity to drink the fluids and um, consume no fluids two to three hours before bedtime. Have a regular time for going to bed each night, including weekends and holidays. Have a consistent bedtime routine. Toilet immediately before going to bed. Toilet any time awakened during the night and toilet immediately upon waking in the morning. So bedwetting alarms. So these can be used for children over six years of age. The success rate is about 70 percent and it helps the child learn to wake up to go to the toilet or to hold on to wee when asleep. The alarm is set off when your child starts to do a wee. It is important the child wakes up with the alarm sounding. You may have to wake your child when first using the alarm. And once the child is awake, they get up and go to the toilet to finish off the week. By using the alarm over a period of time, your child learns to wake up quickly to the feeling of a full bladder. They can get up and go to the toilet or continue to sleep, but not hold on to the week, keeping their bed wet. So this is something you might want to consider talking to with your public health nurse or a neurosis nurse. Um, some of these options if you are concerned about bedwetting. Some of the bedwetting alarms can be a pants alarm. So this is a this is a body worn alarm. A sensor place is placed between two pairs of underwear and connected to a small alarm box. The alarm box is attached to the child's clothes near the shoulder. And when the child passes we the alarm is set off. Another one then is the sensor mat alarm. And this alarm has a sensor mat and alarm box connected by leads or a wireless connection now. The sensor mat is placed on the bed covered by a thin sheet or pillowcase. The alarm box is positioned near the head of the bed, but out of reach so the child has to get out of bed to turn it off. 
So then looking at some regression or setbacks that some parents might have experienced with toileting. So this is when you've noticed progress, the child's getting on great with the toilet training, but they're now having some setbacks or regressions. So if this is happening, we need to look at some possible causes that might have caused this setback. So is there any illness, disease, accident or significant physical influences that have occurred? Any medication changes, changes in fluid or food or fluid consumption, changes in sleep patterns, significant changes in daily routines, might be changing on to summer holidays after a school routine, changes in family structure or home environment, changes in school or classmates, or any increased level of stress or anxiety. What to do then is identify the cause by exploring changes that occurred immediately prior to the regression, discuss any relevant issues with the physician to your GP, minimise the impact of any identified causes and return to using the strategies that resulted in success when the child was being trained. Negative reactions then to taking away diapers. So this might be relevant for some parents who might have experienced this. So placing the diaper over the underpants and over time gradually cutting away or otherwise remove small parts of the diaper. Start with the part that does not provide the greatest amount of satisfying feeling to the child. Another option could be have the child wear underpants instead of diapers for short periods of time daily, gradually increase the number of times per day in underpants, then increase the time frame. And other ones are using pre-teaching strategies and reward wearing underpants. When a child is toilet trained at home, but not in school. So parents and teachers need to share information. This is really important that we know what's going on at home, what's going on in school. Is there any changes in the environment or that could be impacting the child's ability to be toilet trained at home, but not at school. And um, analyze what factors these are at place in home and that have resulted in successfully using the toilet. Duplicate those factors at school using the same materials, toileting schedule and queuing process. So there might be that toileting then visual schedule at home, but there's none at school or any other things that you might notice that were working well at home that aren't in place in school and continue regular communication between home and school to note any progress that is happening in school. So adjusting toileting routines to new situations. So this is when maybe the child is toilet trained at home, but now we're going to a new environment and, and how to adjust this. So anticipate surprises or areas of difficulty for that child and carry a few pictures to aid with the understanding, the, understanding the difference. Carry familiar items such as a small hand towel or soft toilet paper in situations where differences are not tolerated. Turn surprises into a game by changing uncertainties into anticipated and predicted unknowns and explore and practice responses to differences in advance. Just some techniques here. If you're noticing that your child is having significant difficulties with pulling up pants, pulling up their pants and um, just some activities that might be useful to kind of get, learn that skill and um, that we could do outside of the bathroom is using hula hoops. So reaching to the floor and lift the hula hoop slowly up around the body and up over the head. So they're learning that skill of how to pull it up. And this mimics the movements necessary to pull up the pants, working on that bilateral coordination and hand-eye coordination. Use different color hula hoops on the floor and ask the child to step into them one color at a time. And this could improve their ability to follow the order and sequence. Use hula hoops of different weights to work on upper limb strength and body awareness. So this is something we could link in with an OT um, to see if this might be useful. Another one would be a sack race, so where you can encourage the child to take part in a sack race. The pulling up of the sack mimics the actions necessary to pull up the pants. The child would need to maintain their grasp of the sack in order to keep the sack up. We could then ask them to jump around the sack and have a race and this look at the gross motor skills, balance and coordination while also being a fun activity for the child. So some general tips here. So it's important for the child to be eating and drinking well. Ensure your child is eating enough fibre in the day. Encourage your child to eat a wide variety of foods, especially fruits and vegetables, wholemeal breads and cereal products. These foods help prevent constipation and provide essential nutrients. The prevention of constipation is important as it can make bedwetting worse. So encourage your child to drink water spread evenly throughout the day. Aim for your child to drink between six to eight glasses of fluid each day, so approximately two points or one litre. Do not restrict fluids, but make sure your child is not drinking extra fluids before bed. So fibre, it's important with fibre, how to calculate how much fibre your child needs. So children aged 
children age in five in years. So the, sorry, to calculate the fibre intake that your child needs, you need to calculate the child's age in years, then add five grams for the child over two years of age. So for example, if your child is nine years old, then you calculate it as nine plus five equals 14. Therefore, a seven-year-old should be eating 14, sorry, I meant to say nine there. Therefore, a nine-year-old should be eating 14 grams of fibre a day. So fibre then, tips for increasing fibre, wholemeal bread, pasta or brown rice, add linseed to breakfast cereals and yogurts, fruits and vegetables, high fibre biscuits and muesli bars, baked beans, kidney beans, chickpeas and lentils, try adding to bolognese, soups, sauces, stews or casseroles. So there's just some general tips, but if you are concerned, maybe anything in with your GP, um, they might have other advice. So looking at some broad tips then that might be useful um, in general with toileting. Try a four moon stage posse seat and this is closer to the ground, fits a small bottom and helps transition to a grown up toilet. So this is if they're struggling with going straight to a toilet seat. Try fun posse seats like a race car posse or character underwear that is motivating to the child so we're making a positive experience. Try using flushable wipes, sing songs to make toilet training more fun like let it go, let it go, pee pee in the posse. Um, Use tape to make a line for boys to know where to stand. So use putting a tape on the floor if you notice that they're not able to aim into the toilet seat, that they know where to stand. Um, other tips are offer toilet targets or fruit loops to get the pee in the hole for boys. For children who aren't sure if they have to pee or poo, let them sit. It's hard to tell which muscles they are at that age. Keep a posse training chart or offer posse reward stickers for boys or girls to keep them motivated. Try a toileting schedule. Have your child sit on the toilet every 15 minutes for a few minutes. If they go, woohoo, big praise. If not, that's okay. We'll try again in 15 minutes. So provide a kitchen timer for a set posse sitting times. Let your child set the timer so that they are part of the process. Tips then for children with ASD. So it's important to consider the posse stage if your child has difficulty with change. So it may be um, better to go straight to the toilet because you're changing up the routine. It may be harder to go from the potty to the toilet. So whatever works best for your for your child. Um, try washable, reusable training underpants or underpants with a protective liner. Use specific language like sitting on the toilet and do a wee. Choose one word to refer to going to the toilet. Teach your child a way of letting you know that they need to go to the toilet. So it might be pictures. Five minutes sitting on the toilet is enough and try to stay calm and positive. So there's some references that I got for this presentation. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I'll be live now to answer any questions. <laughs>